You guys are heading to Arizona next week, right? Yeah, we are so going to miss you. Um, Hubby was bragging this morning about being warm and dry. So, but we, uh, we'll be praying for you guys as uh, you miss our glorious winter here. So, yeah. Hey, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, our family is pretty multi-ethnic. I don't know about you. I mean, our, we, one of our daughters of our five grown kids, uh, she's Athabascan, half Athabascan, half Jordanian from the Middle East. She married a, a <coughs> Chilean, a boy from Chile, although he grew up in Miami, so he's not really from Chile, but, uh, but he's Chilean descent. Uh, we have uh, grandkids that are different shades of color, and uh, we love that. We love being a multi-ethnic family. Uh, we, we haven't always gotten good feedback from being a multi-ethnic family, um, but it is something that has been a blessing to us. Well, guess what? Guess what God's family is? It is a multi-ethnic family, right? Uh, we, we are going to be looking at the book of Ephesians, and uh, I think we have some PowerPoint going to come up here in just a second. But we are looking at the book of Ephesians, and we're going to be doing a series in uh, Q4 here. Uh, in this last quarter of the year, we'll be looking through these six chapters. And today, we're just going to kind of give you an intro to Ephesians and look at the greeting, just the first two verses, all right? So that's what we're going to do today. And uh, we'll mix in Thanksgiving, and certainly we will prioritize and focus on Christmas in December. But one of the most interesting books of the Bible, out, outside of Colossians, it's probably my favorite book. And I've preached out of Colossians the last four months several times. And uh, you're going to find out why. Because in the book of Ephesians... It is all about a new multi-ethnic family of God. That's what it's about. It describes it so perfect. It, it talks about how this old covenant uh, has been, has been uh, rearranged in a new covenant to accept not just the Jewish nation, but all the Gentiles have been grafted in because of God's amazing redemptive grace. And so we're going to be looking at Ephesians this morning. We're going to get started uh, today with uh, just thinking about what uh, this book begins to look like. So give, give us that next slide there, Jared. Uh, and, uh, and when you're thinking about Ephesians, you're, you're really looking at uh, this, this, I want you to begin to think about the book of Ephesians as a, a look at uh, from God about a new multi-ethnic family that you're part of. So if, um, you know, we all have a little prejudice in, in our bodies, um, in our minds, in our hearts. Uh, I used to think I had absolutely none because I grew up in such a multi-ethnic kind of context with people, but, but we all do. And I can tell you, none of that will happen in heaven. Amen. Aren't you glad? There will be no biases, there will be no judgments, there will be, there will be no uh, second guessing, there will be no uh, you know, comments uh, since we haven't walked in somebody else's shoes. I can remember having uh, foster kids years and years ago in Evansville, Indiana. I remember uh, Lisa would go to the store, we had a, group, a sibling group of three foster kids, and uh, we had our own two. Abby, you know, Zach was in like I don't know, first or second grade then, he's 38 now. And uh, Abby was uh, like kindergarten or below and uh, preschool. I can remember Lisa having four preschoolers in the cart and no room for groceries, amen? I can remember her coming home and getting her feelings hurt at the store because of nasty little comments, the stupid things like, do you know what causes that? You know, crazy things, right, that people say. I've been in uh, situations where people have said things about people's context, their culture, their color, 
all my life, and we just live in that kind of a world, don't we? Unfortunately. But, um, but Christ changes all that. He changes all of humanity into a new humanity. One that is a, a, a part of the family of God. It is a part of an ethnic-centered family of God. So if you're listening on Facebook and, and uh, you don't like that, that'll get changed in heaven. Amen? That'll get changed. If you have a problem with somebody's color or culture, uh, you better work on it if you're a follower of Jesus because that is not of God. That is the old humanity, the world, the flesh, and the devil trying to separate people um, because anything that God, we, I think we talked about this uh, in uh, Zechariah this morning. By the way, if you're not in Sunday school study, I think we had 19 or 20 in the adult class and some youth and kids, but man, uh, Mike teaches and leads a great discussion on our minor prophets. So we just finished Malachi and Zechariah now, and you're sure invited at that 10 o'clock hour for the Bible study. So I think we mentioned this this morning. Anything good that God has, the devil wants to destroy it, right? He wants to destroy it. And so in Ephesians, what we find is the city of Ephesus. And, um, and in the city of Ephesus, um, we find that Paul had this acquaintance with this city. And if you were to go, that we won't today, but if you wanted to go find out how Paul got acquainted with the city of Ephesus, then you just go to Acts 19 and read Acts 19. Uh, Paul was a missionary on mission and uh, he finds himself for the better part of three years. I'm not exactly sure, but it was, it was more than two and a half years, closer to three years that Paul spent in this city <laughs> at Ephesus. So you can read about that in Acts 19. I think a second thing that you need to know as we work through this study on the book of Ephesians is this fact that it was an epicenter of worship, but not worship of our God, Yahweh. <laughs> It was uh, the Roman and Greek gods, and uh, there were many, and this was kind of a central place where people came to worship the, the gods, the Roman and Greek gods. So it was a very spiritual place by nature, right? You do know that Alaska is a very spiritual place. Did you know that? Yes, our, our native villages, our rural communities, People are, uh, this is a very spiritual climate. Uh, unfortunately, it's not just spiritual in the nature of people wanting to search and have spiritual conversations, but also power and principalities as well. Uh, and so you find that, that Ephesus was like that. It was the epicenter of worship, a very spiritual place, but it was more a spirit of power and principalities than it was the spirit of God. But Paul began to change that as a missionary. And uh, the third thing that you need to know about this city was that it, 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 it became a gospel-centered city because of Paul's missionary journeys. And so it, it had a gospel-centered presence in it as a church was started. And uh, so there was this gospel-centered presence, this gospel-centered church. By the way, that's exactly what we try to do in missions with apostolic gifts, missionary gifts, uh, with church planters and missionaries. That's what we try to do at our Barnabas Ministries in 118 of our villages and all of our rural road system is support those 135 or so missionary, evangelical missionaries spread out all over Alaska. Our goal is to be a Catholic at Art Barnabas to see um, a gospel-centered presence and or church in every community in Alaska, not just in more urban populations like we are here in Kenai, Saldana. Yeah, I know, we're urban. We really are. When you, can, when you get out to some rural road systems in some of our villages, we are urban, and our culture acts like it as well. And so it's really important to understand that Ephesus uh, came out of a heart of a missionary with apostolic or missionary gifts uh, to see kingdom impact happen and a, a gospel-centered presence and church begin in a place that desperately, desperately needed it. A lot of people at Ephesus. That next slide, Jared. 
And so uh, that's a little bit about Ephesus as we work through this study in the book of Ephesians. And um, there are, uh, there, there's a division here in the book of Ephesians that you're probably already familiar with, but if not, let me just uh, let you know and remind you who, who have studied this book before. It really is split right down the middle of these six chapters. So you have the first three chapters that is much more about doctrine and getting your foundation right uh, with the gospel. And uh, it, it, is, it is really talking about our worth in these first three chapters. Uh, the next three chapters are, are less about doctrine and more about what it looks like after we become a follower of Jesus and how he begins to transform our life and what it looks like to behave. Um, and so uh, belief is in the first three chapters. And because of our belief, uh, we don't just automatically start behaving this way in chapters uh, uh, 4, 5, and 6. But once we belong, which is not seen in the middle here, but the division or the transition between the first three chapters and the last three chapters of belief and behavior or worth and walk, how we walk, in the last three chapters is seen in the fact that we belong. We belong to Jesus. And so we believe chapters one through three takes a look at all that is involved in believing in Jesus. And now we belong to him. Uh, let's stop there a second because let's make, let's make absolutely clear as evangelicals what we mean by that who are grace-based people. We never mean that we believe in Jesus and then we've got to have certain behaviors in place in order to belong. That is the wrong order. That is not a biblical order, right? Because none of us have all the right behaviors to belong. Amen? Amen. Amen. None of us. We all still sin. Being a Christian is not about our practice. It is about our position in Christ. And, we'll, and God changes and transforms us from the inside out Religion works on us from the outside in. That's why it doesn't work. There's no energy. There's no power. Uh, there's no real experience in the outside in. There's only power on the inside out when God lives in us. And so uh, let's, let's make, make sure that you understand in the book of Ephesians, when we get through the first three chapters over these weeks about doctrine and and uh, it reflecting what we're worth to God, our value to ourselves, to others, and to God. And then we get into the last three chapters about uh, our behavior, or our walk, and how we walk, how we live our life. Understand that, that that is only because we already belong. Behavior comes after belonging. Changing our behavior comes after belonging. Otherwise, it's just another form of religion with no personal relationship at all. Right. So make sure that you understand that. And that is one of the one of the guardrails, one of the guiding principles. It, it is one of the success factors of life in following Jesus. And so you, you have these, these two kinds of, uh, of dynamics going on here in the book. In the first three chapters, it starts out in chapter one with, with what scholars would call this Jewish point, right? And uh, we, we know that because in chapter 1, we're going to look at the first two verses in a minute, but he starts out with, Blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us. Well, that's a, that's a, a, a style, a Hebrew style of a point. And so he goes through that, um, and then he hits down into that point, he hits the fact that, that we are uh, in God's mind, in eternity past, before we were ever, and before anything or anybody was ever, God was, and God was thinking about us. The foundation of the world, right? That's what the Bible said. And, and so God was dreaming up how he was going to create all that he created, including the top priority of his creation, which is humanity, you and me. And so he talks about God's story the gospel story in these first three chapters. And so the first three chapters are all in the context of, of God's story, but the gospel story. You see, God's story is, is all over the Old Testament, but the gospel story 
that mystery that's been revealed in Christ is right here in the first three chapters. And he gives us everything we need to know about it. Um, it is definitely Jesus-centered. Uh, you, you, you can't count how many times uh, Paul references or, or uh, mentions something and then he reflects this fact that, that it's all about Jesus, that this comes from him in us or it's in him, we're in him, that kind of a thing. It, he begins to explain in the first three chapters here, I think it's about chapter two into chapter three, uh, about how there's this, this, new, this new person that uh, arises and um, comes out because of the gospel and the redemptive plan of God that God thought of before the world was even really formed and, and how there's a new covenant. Now the, the barriers around the old covenant that God made with a nation and a people have all been uprooted and taken out and removed. And now there's this new covenant that allows Gentiles to get in on heaven. Amen. And of course, Paul is that guy, that catalyst missionary uh, who God used to, to usher in this new covenant based in Christ and the gospel. So he begins to talk about these very foundational doctrines in the first three chapters. And all of that, he, he talks in, in terms of forgiveness and grace. All of that is available to us uh, Gentiles to join the Jews in the great plan that God has for every person's life, this redemptive plan, to be a new person in Christ and be part of this, 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 uh, uh, this multi-ethnic family of God here and forever in heaven. It's going to be a beautiful study as we walk through the doctrinal foundation of, of our work to God. And, and, and he kind of starts ending uh, with talking about the new person and our real purpose in following Jesus Christ. But then you get over to the next three chapters and you find uh, our life story. So you've got the gospel life story that, that is transformative for us. And, and so we begin to, to live into, as we lean into following Jesus, because we belong, now God begins to change us from the inside out. Not perfection, but consistency. Uh, habitual practices start forming. Our life begins to change. And you'll find that he talks about a couple of different kinds of uh, in Colossians, he certainly talks about a couple of different categories about how our life changes. These big, huge things that not many of us do anyway. And then he goes to a second category of things that we all are involved in. <laughs> Pride and gossip and those kinds of things. And God changes everything from the big things that people are involved in that are, uh, that, that are in the category of sin, sin and very consequential in your life to the very minute things that God did not intend for us to do, right? And it is never about being sinless, but it is always about God moving us and transforming us and changing us into a new person to learn how to sin less, for sure. And, and, and he begins to walk through uh, our life story in a way that, that uh, he uses the word walk or the way we live. And, and so you begin to see in those last three uh, chapters, um, what it looks like to walk in unity with God and with people. It, you begin to see what it looks like to walk in love, godly love. Not, not just a physical love, but a godly love, a friendship kind of a love, a family love, as well as a marriage type love. Uh, and, and light, what's it look like to walk or live your life in light? How do you influence people with that? The wisdom, walk in wisdom, right? And of course, James says if we ask, God promises he'll give wisdom. And, and uh, what's it look like to walk in submission to God? What's it look like to, to walk even chapter 6, right? That's the one you know best probably from the book of Ephesians is uh, the warfare chapter, right? What's it look like to walk in warfare? So this is going to be a great study uh, over these next weeks. So if you miss one, hopefully we'll be able to post it and, and uh, you'll be able to, to, get, to track with that. All right, get that next slide up there. Let's begin to uh, talk this morning about verses one and two. All right. So 
most people will pass uh, right past the greeting. In fact, in your Bible, it probably has that heading up there that says greeting. It doesn't matter, you know, what uh, version of Bible you have. Just the heading up there probably says greeting. Anybody's Bible say anything except greeting if you have headings? Probably they all say greeting. In fact, what's interesting about this, even when you go to an online commentary and you put in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, very seldom does the commentary start with chapter 1, verse 1. Usually start with chapter 1, verse 3. Because, hey, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, is that's just Paul's greed. Right? Well, and, and, and in some respects, that's true. But in, in the book of Ephesians, it's a little different. Let, let, me, let me tell you what I mean. So uh, let me read this, and, and then we'll kind of pick this apart just a little bit. Here's what he says. Chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Now, in, in your Bible, there should be a space there, like it's another paragraph moving to the next sentence. So it's a whole other thought. And he says uh, in the Greek, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. That's a little tricky. We'll talk about that what that really means. And then there's another space, and like it's another paragraph, another thought, and he says, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, when you're thinking about the greeting here, it is much more than just a greeting. In fact, it is a, uh, it, it, it is a theological setup for everything Paul's going to talk about in the next in these three first three chapters that lead to the transformational power of the God who lives in us in the in the presence of the Spirit of God, uh, and, and it's it's very unique. So there are some things that are similar to Paul's basic greeting in, in his other epistles. Um, for instance, um, you know. Um, in, in this particular case, when he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ for the will of God, that's the first of the three elements that you see in the greeting. So there are really three elements here to Paul's greeting. And, and um, what, what you begin to realize is that um, after you read the greeting and then read through here, there's very little said about the church at Ephesus. Very little. And the only place he even mentions that this is to the church at Ephesus is in the second element there. That second sentence. Um, there's really no other place that you could tell. And most scholars would agree today that this was meant to be a circular letter, not just to the church at Ephesus, like he wrote to the church at Colossae, Colossae or to the church at Rome, um, the Romans. So, so this is a letter that, that uh, as you look at both sides of was this added to, uh, to Ephesus or in Ephesus in, in chapter uh, 1 here um, at the, the second part of verse 1 in the saints who are in Ephesus. Was that added later? Some say it's added later. But then there's a really good strong argument that I go with. It wasn't added later. It was originally written this way. Um, but Paul was in prison. Remember, this is, a, this is a prison epistle or prison letter. So Paul wrote this from prison. Paul's a kingdom thinker, right? He, he's not just thinking in prison about a community, but he's thinking about the whole kingdom of God and advancing the kingdom of God uh, in the known world at that particular point in time. And, and so uh, I'm thinking, in my mind, as I've looked at both sides of what scholars offer here, because there's not a lot of talking or mentioning names of leaders from uh, Ephesus and the church there. So this is years later after Paul's already spent the better part of three years with him. Now Paul, toward the end of his ministry, many, many years later, is writing them a letter. Now there's this gospel-centered presence, this gospel-centered church. And there is this transformation power beginning to circulate 
There are people who are a witness there. Uh, they're taking advantage of a climate that is spiritual, where spiritual conversations are the norm in their culture because of the Roman and Greek gods. And they're beginning to share the true, real gospel of the one and only God. And all of a sudden, you've got the church beginning to multiply. And years later, Paul's writing them this letter. But it was a letter not just meant for them, but for that whole region, for them to circulate around the body of Christ in that time. And so you see in this first element, this first sentence, Paul... So something that Paul's uh, greetings had in common was who's the sender? Well, it's Paul. Who's the receiver? In this case, it does say the people in Ephesus. And what is the, the real purpose of the letter? And you begin to see him say that. So let's look at it real quick as we break it down. We just have a few minutes here to do this. And, and, um, and then uh, we'll... Call it, a, call it a morning, and next week we'll pick up on some real foundational theology that Paul brings to the table here about this, uh, this new family of God, this multi-ethnic family of God. By the way, even in first century Christianity, there was more prejudice against ethnicity than you could count, just like there's always been. So this was a, a very new concept to talk about how we are all one in Christ. All one. No Jew, no Greek, we're all one. No black, white, red, yellow, we're all one in the family of God. And that's, that's the way it should be. Amen, church? Amen. Um, and that you are not considered in, in your local setting of what we would call a church, a body of Christ, it's not about how you believe and then behave if you belong. No, no. No, that's where churches get in a lot of trouble, isn't it? Oh, no. You, you conform to how we believe and you behave that way. At camp uh, this last week, we had missionary testimonies that would just break your heart. And somebody said uh, to someone that they didn't wear a dress in their village to church. And some people started rumoring that they weren't even a Christian because they didn't wear a dress. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. I know. I know it's crazy, right? But there are all kinds of there are all kinds of conformity that we expect if we're not careful that are very religious. You don't cut your hair right, you don't wear your hair right, you don't dress right, you know. I mean the list just goes on and on and on, right? So we have to be very, very careful in the body of Christ to understand that. To follow Jesus means that we believe. We believe. We trust him as Savior and Lord. Nothing else. There's nothing else. That's it. There's, there's no doing something for it. There's no dressing a certain way. There's no cutting out sin I've got in my life and cleaning myself up. Otherwise, if I could do that, why would I need Jesus and his blood? There's, no, there's nothing else. He accepts us. I mean, we sing that song, right? Just as I am. We sing that so much. It's an it's a imitation song. Come just as we are. And, and so, so that has to be one of the guardrails that we have in the church. Understanding that when we come to Christ, it's out of our belief in him to follow him. And our behavior doesn't have anything to do with salvation. Now, it has to do with sanctification inside of our salvation. And doctrine's important. In fact, Paul's writing half of it here in this letter about doctrine and how important it is to understand it. Because, because that we do begin to conform or behave in a different way, live our life in a different way, after we belong, not before we belong. Amen. And so, so he says, uh, Paul, so he's the sender, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Two things are important here when he says an apostle of Jesus Christ. First of all, he's saying, I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. Hopefully you can say that this morning. Without any doubt, amen, I belong to Jesus. Amen. Now that, you've got to be careful of false guilt and false shame. 
Because false, you know, real guilt and real shame are good. They're, they're meant for, for our best. But false guilt and false shame would say, well, I hesitate to say I belong to Jesus. Because, I mean, I, he's my Savior, but, you know, I mean, I don't always live like it. No, no. See, you're putting behavior before belonging. Amen. That's religion. That's what religion does. That's not what, that's not what the gospel does. That's not what Christianity is about. That's not what Jesus came to die for. He didn't come to die for you to change some behavior. He came to die so that you would be righteous in the sight of God and that you would belong to God. And then when you belong to God, God works in your life and changes your life. Amen? Amen. The rest of it is just mere religiosity that we slap onto other people. I don't even think they're a Christian. Why, why do you not think they're a Christian? They, they profess Jesus Christ and they're, well, because look at the way they're living. Well, look at the way you lived. Amen? Look at the way you still live by that statement. Amen? <laughs> Got to be careful about judging fruit. We judge heart and we can judge fruit, but we don't judge a heart. There we go. I get that right. We don't judge a heart. We can judge fruit. But then when we do judge fruit, the Bible is very clear that the same way in which we judge, we will be judged by that same man. So we've got to be careful even about judging fruit. Um, and so, so he says, uh, an, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's saying, I belong to Jesus Christ. I believe in him. I belong to him. And he changed me. <laughs> He changed me from a religious, crazy religious leader to a follower. Amen. That sounds like it's taken a step down, but I can assure you that's taken a huge leap forward. Amen. And, and he says, so, so I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I belong to him. And second of all, I am his authorized messenger as an apostle to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, notice, notice what he says, by the will of God. In other words, this is by his own calling. You remember Paul's testimony uh, early in Acts? Paul got knocked off the, the mule, right? Uh, the Spirit of God. Uh, the, the Spirit of God dealt with Paul. And, uh, and he had an encounter uh, with Jesus. And uh, it was hard for others to trust him because he was responsible for so many Christians dying. And, and so he says, uh, I, I am um, an, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. It's his calling. It's, it's through his will, his divine plan. Listen, whoever you are in Christ, it is because of God's divine plan. Amen. Not some environment that shaped you. Not some parents that you did have or didn't have. Not some place you grew up in. I'm not saying that environment doesn't shape us. But the truth is, God is the one who overcomes environment and any other thing that you could ever think about in your life, God changes people. If he can change an alcoholic biker like me and keep me that way for 40 years, he can do it for anybody. I can assure you of that. Amen. Amen. And uh, that could be said for you, I'm sure. And so he, say, he says here, by the, by the will of God, God called me. To be his messenger, his authorized messenger, and uh, to uh, he sent me, and Paul recognizes, you find later, that he has been sent to the Gentiles to help them understand they've been grafted into a new covenant in Christ, not an old covenant that was based on uh, a Jewish, a Jewish people. Right, a Hebrew people. In fact, you could go all the way back to Genesis 12, where he talked about how Abraham's descendants would be more than the stars in the sky, the sand on the beach, right? God had that in mind even in Genesis 12. God had in mind this new family, this multi-ethnic family of God in a new covenant. He had that in mind in Genesis 12. And, and, and look how he, he says, um, 
an apostle of Jesus Christ. Here, here's something that all three elements have. All three are tied to Christ. Second element there, to the saints who are in Ephesus, faithful in Christ Jesus. Third one, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, he ties all three of these elements to Jesus Christ. So, so you find uh, this, this very first thing here, Paul's purpose. He is a messenger authorized by God, sent by God to share what God wants him to share. That is his purpose. Has that changed? Doesn't Acts say we are to be his witnesses? Uh, Paul talks in the, to the Corinthian church about how we are his ambassadors. Um, uh, the the, the uh, um, end of Matthew talks about the Great Commission, how we're to be disciple makers. So it, that purpose hasn't changed for you and me. We represent the only one and true God that ever was, ever, that is, and ever will be. We represent Him. That's part of our worth, our value. God chose us to represent him and chose us to be the temple he lives in. Isn't that so cool? That's just, I, that's just mind-blowing, right? If you think you're not worth something, you think about hurting yourself, you, you think about life not being worth living, if you're a follower of Jesus, and by the way, followers of Jesus can get that way. You can get that way. You can get depressed. You can, you can not care anymore. I want to tell you, you just have, you got to get in touch with the value you have um, with God. His love for us goes way beyond our ability to understand love. And, and, and so here's the second one, the second element, to the saints, the saints. It, it's more than just set apart ones. You know that word, I mean, saints. It, it doesn't mean we're, we're pious and holy. It's not what that word means. Um, that may be how it's portrayed today. It doesn't mean that you're without sin. That's for sure. Uh, it means that you are set apart. But it doesn't just mean that you are set apart to God as his creation to follow him. But it is uh, our position, right? We are considered saints in our position. We, we have... Jesus Christ now, we, we've committed to follow him as our personal Savior, the Lord, the boss of our life. We belong. And now he's going to start working on our behavior. He's going to start changing us from the inside out. So we believe. Now we belong. Now he lives in us. And we have a, a, a supernatural power that lives in us that we experience every day and probably miss the supernatural things he's doing most days. And he is changing us from the inside out. It's not believe and uh, we're working on our behavior and God is dealing with us and, and, uh, and if we do better, we belong. No, 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 that's just religion. That's not Christianity. I know I keep repeating it for a reason here. It is believe, now we belong to him. Now we, we trust in Christ as our Savior, believe. Now we belong to him. Now behavior begins to change. And for some people, behavior changes slower for lots of reasons than other people. Amen? And that's when we shake our head like some of you are doing. Yeah, well, I'm thinking of somebody right now. Maybe it's you. Maybe you're thinking of yourself. I don't know. Um, for some people, we go into spurts of accelerated change and transformation, and then we hit these walls. And uh, for others, it's a much slower pace. But it is the church, the the, the local community in the universal uh, um, church of the Lord Jesus, uh, where we're to create a climate for people to believe and belong. And when we keep adding behavior to it, they feel like they don't belong. Amen. And they don't go to church. And it stunts their growth. And then it, it makes them think and wonder, well, did I really even trust Jesus? And they pray a hundred times in, in 300 days to receive him again because we've made them unsure. Right. Because we can't accept them like they are even though we expect God to accept us like we are. It's a double standard. 
This community doesn't need another church like that. The Lord knows we've got too many of those. Amen. Amen. I'm not saying all of our churches are that way, but <laughs> I've led church net two large church networks across the U.S., and I can tell you there are way more churches who tack on behavior to believe in order to belong right. than there needs to be. Right. Nobody, nobody can live up to that. That's a standard nobody can meet. That's a measurement that's not biblical. I'm glad when God saw me and I believed at 5 o'clock in the morning and trusted Him as my Savior and Lord with all of my sinfulness and stuff and everything in my life was horrible. I'm glad at that very second I then became a person who belonged to Him. And He came into my life and began to change me. And I, man, I'm telling you, it's hard to change it. Hard to change that worldliness, that flesh, that power principality, devil attack, it's hard to change. But we have the power to do that. And so, so he says to the saints, those who are set apart, but again, not just set apart, but those who are in a new covenant with God. This is a, those who are becoming a new person in Christ. Those who the old is passing and the new is coming. Right? Those who are created in Christ and are beginning to change from the inside out and not just uh, adopt who he adopted kids and adopt the family we're in, but we're adapting to that family. Amen. I no longer say no. I say, oh, 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 okay. <laughs> and I get to the point where I go, yes, sir. Right? That's change. That's transformation. So, it's part of this new covenant. Uh, not some pious understanding that, that I have to beat around the bush and be humble about being a saint. No, you don't. You're a saint. When you believe you're a saint, Amen. you're set aside for God. You're a saint. So own it. Don't shy away from it. Amen. If you have to explain that, hey, a saint for me doesn't mean, well, for me or anybody doesn't mean that I'm more pious than you. I'm no more spiritual than anybody else. I'm, I'm not holy in the sense of perfection or piety. I'm just set apart for God. And God is, is at work in me. And because God is at work in me, I know God's going to work through me. And if I can ever get to the point where I grow enough to quit focusing all of my time and energy on what's happening to me all the time and around me all the time and worried about around me and to me, then one day I'm going to see what God is actually doing in me and how He wants to work through me and my family and at my job and with my friends and at my church and in my community and how He wants me to be part of impacting the world for the kingdom of God. Amen. He will change you. He will. If you believe you belong and your behavior will change. It just will. Now, there's our part for sure. It's called obedience. <laughs> um, but that's why we help each other, amen. amen? That's why we help each other. So, he says, saints, who are in Ephesus, um, again, this is, this is a little tricky for scholars because this was a, a circular letter. I believe Paul wrote it just like it says. I believe, I believe God's power to preserve what he had through translation and give to us in another language and I, I believe part of why he doesn't mention anybody else at Ephesus in that church or anything about that church at Ephesus other than this. and just goes all into doctrine and then all into how we live our life in the other three chapters is because he, he wanted other people to read it and not get tired of saying, well, this is not for us. What's well, it for those folks over at Ephesus? I, I'm not going to read the rest of this. This is for folks in Ephesus, right? I think that's part of why um, he doesn't mention all of it. So he says, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, boy, if I were to ask you what does faithfulness in Christ Jesus mean, you would probably have 